Hi, I'm Chris, and if you've been following along with this series, you know that we have a simple multiplication circuit, which can multiply two 16-bit floating point numbers. In this video, I'm going to look over the code and point out ways that our simple design can be improved, making the code more general and easier to test. Before getting into the actual substance of this video, I'd like to ask a favor of you. If you're watching this video, it's likely you have friends and colleagues who will also be interested in the content. Please share this video with the people you know who might have an interest in this topic. Thanks. Now on to the show. The source code for this video can be downloaded from GitHub. In the comments section, I've included directions for making your own local copy of the repository. The source code includes both the updated version of the class module and the test bench code for verifying the updated module. Allow me to reiterate my favorite hobby horse for this series. Using modern hardware design tools is more like writing software than building hardware. Let's take a look at our current version of the HP Mole module. The code is littered with what I refer to as magic numbers. They appear almost immediately in the code. Look at the declaration of the input and output parameters. These declarations create bit vectors which have bit 15 as their most significant bit. Farther down in the code we again use the number 15 but this time it represents the exponent bias value for 16-bit floating point numbers. This is what I mean by magic numbers. When we read the code and see the value 15 it's not immediately obvious what the number means. We have to hunt around for the context of what the code is doing at that particular point and then deduce the value's meaning. If I were writing this code in C, I would use macro definitions so that the intent of the code was clear. Verilog has a feature called parameters which serve a similar function. I want to start with a simple example, so let's go back to our original implementation of the HP class module. To refresh your memory, this is the code. What parameters should we use? One's first inclination might be to define a parameter which specifies the number of bits in the floating point value. But before defining any parameters, let's think about what it is we're operating on. Floating point numbers break down into three fields. The sign bit, the exponent field, and the significant field. The sign bit is just that. It's always a single bit, so we probably don't need a parameter to represent its size. The exponent and significant fields do change depending upon whether we're operating on 16, 32, 64, or 128 bit operands. If we create parameters for the number of exponent bits and the number of significant bits, we can compute the number of bits in our floating point value from these parameters. With these two parameters, we can change our declaration of the input vector f to the following. Then the statements for computing EXP1s, EXP0s, and SIG0s can be rewritten as seen here. Let's look at a reason for using the reduction AND and reduction NOR operators, which I didn't cover when I introduced their use. If I didn't use the reduction AND operator, the code for calculating EXP1s would look like either of the following statements. What happens if I want to port this module so it can be reused for 32-bit floating point numbers? The calculation of EXP1s would get changed to look like one of the following statements. Not only do I have to manually change the bit numbers in the square brackets, I also have to manually change the number of bits used in the computation because 32-bit floating point numbers have an exponent field which is 8 bits wide. The same goes for the calculation of EXP zeros and SIG zeros. Now because I've used the reduction AND and reduction NOR operators, just by changing the two parameters NEXP and NSIG, the module will work with all of the IEEE binary floating point formats. Looks like a win to me. The code for computing the NAND flags also needs to be rewritten to use the NSIG parameter. The statements for computing the remaining flags don't require any changes. We're not done with this module yet. The code we've been looking at was the version of the module before I added the extra functionality needed by the HP Mole module 
to extract and adjust the exponent and significant fields for subnormal and normal numbers. Let's have a look at the code needed to support that extra functionality. The changes needed to parameterize the first few lines should be fairly obvious. Here are the first few lines before they've been parameterized. And here they are after replacing all the magic numbers with symbolic names. The first line which is not so obvious is this line which extracts the exponent and significant fields for normal numbers. The values 14, 10, and 9 are easily replaced with nexp plus nsig minus 1 nsig and nsig minus 1 respectively. It's the value 15 which requires some analysis. This is another example of the value 15 representing the exponent bias value for 16-bit numbers. If we can express the bias value as a function of the number of bits in the exponent field, when the size of the exponent field changes, our new bias value will automatically stay in sync. In section 3.4 of the IEEE standard, we're told that the bias is equal to 2 to the quantity w minus 1 power minus 1, where w is the width of the exponent field in bits. Since shifting the value left is the same as multiplying the original value by powers of 2, we can compute the bias value using this statement. So the line for extracting fexp and fsig now looks like this. Now let's look at how to parameterize the logic for extracting the exponent and significant of subnormal numbers. Why do we go through the loop four times? We need to shift the significant up to ten places to the left. Each time through the loop, the shift amount is a power of two. Ten, when written as a binary number, is one zero one zero. We require four bits to hold the value ten and this corresponds to why we need to go through the loop four times. Does this logic hold for 32-bit floating-point numbers? The significant field for 32-bit floating-point numbers is 23 bits wide. Using the current loop, when we execute four times, we can only shift the significant up to 15 places. We need to go through the loop one more time. Our current maximum shift amount is 8. If we go through the loop one more time, the first time through we should be shifting by 16 places to the left. Also, 23, written in binary, is 10111, which requires a minimum of 5 bits. Things are looking good so far. I'll leave it to you, the viewer, to consider the cases of 64-bit floating-point numbers, which have a 52-bit significant and 128-bit floating-point numbers, which have a 112-bit significant. So we need another parameter which represents how many times we need to go through the loop. For now, I'm just going to call this parameter x. If I told you the final name for this parameter, I would be getting ahead of myself. Rewriting our loop using parameters, the new code looks like this. Okay, this works, but I've created a new problem. Parameter x. I don't like it. We shouldn't be manually computing a new value for how many times we go through the loop whenever the size of the significant changes, and that's currently what we have to do. This gets back to good software engineering practice. I would like for x to be automatically recalculated based on the value of nsig. There are ways to do this in Verilog, but I haven't been able to find any way to do this in Verilog which is built in. That is, I could write my own code which takes the nsig value as input and returns an appropriate value for x, but that's one more piece of code I have to write and potentially screw up. Also, it's one more piece of code to write tests for. If you know of some built-in way to do this in Verilog, please let me know in the comments below. What I need is a built-in function which takes as input an unsigned number and tells me the minimum number of bits required to represent that value. This is essentially taking the log base 2 of a number. While Verilog doesn't have this feature, at least not while running Vivado, it turns out that System Verilog does have such a function. System Verilog is a superset of Verilog. So our parameter statement now becomes parameter C log 2 underscore nsig equals dollar sign C log 2 of nsig plus 1. 
Note that I'm not passing nsig to the function. I'm passing nsig plus 1. I'm leaving it as an exercise to the viewer to explain why I need to add 1 to nsig. Now I can change all references to the parameter x to clog2 underscore nsig. Since the file is now a system Verilog file, I'm changing the file suffix to .sv. The only line left is the line which computes the exponent for the subnormal number. For the binary 16 format, the smallest exponent for a normal number is minus 14. The IEEE standard calls the smallest normal exponent emin. Emin is defined as 1 minus emax. Emax is computed using the same formula as the bias value, so we create a new parameter emin where parameter emin equals 1 minus bias. We compute the exponent of a subnormal number using this new parameter. Now, there's one more thing we need to check. The size of the F EXP bit vector is two bits bigger than the width of the exponent field. We need to confirm that for 32, 64, and 128 bit values, that this is still big enough to hold the smallest possible exponent after we've multiplied two numbers together. I've shown how to do this previously for 16-bit floating point numbers, so I'm not going to repeat those computations here. Besides, it would be a good exercise to help you cement your understanding of the material being covered. Without using parameters, I would have to have an HP class module for 16-bit floating point numbers, an SP class module for 32-bit floating point numbers, a DP class module for 64-bit floating point numbers, and a QP class module for 128-bit floating point numbers. Now, I can have a single module which covers all IEEE binary floating point formats, so I'm going to change the name of the module to FP class to reflect its newly acquired flexibility. I'll show you how we control the NEXP and NSIG parameters in the FP class module in a bit. Okay, we've made all these changes, and they all need to be tested. When we tested the original version of the module, we tested all of the possible 16-bit values. We can't do an exhaustive test of all 32-bit, 64-bit, and 128-bit values. I'm not expecting the universe to live that long, much less myself. If you remember back to the video where I tested the original 16-bit version of the HP class module, there was an order to the types of values we saw as the loop counter counted through all of the possible values. The hexadecimal values 0000 through 7FFF all had their sign bit set to 0, meaning that for values which represented actual numerical types, that is, everything except the NANDs, were positive numbers. With the counter starting at 0, we saw, in order, positive 0, a run of positive subnormal numbers, a run of positive normal numbers, positive infinity, a run of signaling NANDs followed by a run of quiet NANDs. As the counter covered the range hexadecimal 8000 to FFFF, we saw the sequence repeat with a change of sign for the numerical types. Instead of testing all possible input values, perhaps it's enough to test the return flags at the places where the value types change. So we test hexadecimal 0000 to ensure that the FP class module sets the zero flag. Then we verify that hexadecimal 0001 and hexadecimal 03FF are both identified as subnormal numbers. Then we verify that 0400 and 7BFF are both identified as normal numbers. Then verify that 7C00 is identified as infinity. Verify that 7C01 and 7DFF are identified as signaling NANDs. Verify 7E00 and 7FFF are identified as quiet NANDs. Then repeat the cycle for the values from hexadecimal 8000 to FFFF. That works for 16-bit numbers, but what about the others? We need to build these test values using the parameters NEXP and NSIG 
so we can use the same code to test the 32, 64, and 128-bit cases. To start, our test cases look like the following. Of course, this sequence of tests needs to be repeated with the sign bit changed to 1. Notice that for the NAND values, smallest positive and largest positive are in quotes. This is because NANDs are neither negative nor positive, and they are unordered, meaning they don't have a sense of a NAND being larger or smaller than any other floating point value. Less than, greater than comparisons with NANDs always return false. I added one more set of tests to cover the fact that I modified the logic for extracting the significant of subnormal numbers. It verifies that the shifting and exponent adjustment logic still works. This test was also implemented using parameterized values, so it can be used with all the IEEE binary floating point formats. As you can see by the comment, I ran into the same problem embedding the test in a for loop as I experienced in my previous video. Again, it's either a rookie Verilog programming mistake on my part or a problem with Vivado. Since I still consider myself a Verilog newbie, the fault is probably mine. If any of you can point out what I'm doing wrong in the version of the test which is commented out in the code, please let me know. Thanks. Now, how does the test bench control what values FP class uses for NEXP and NSIG? We pass the NEXP and NSIG values when we instantiate the module. It's important to note that FP class receives these values in order, not by name. If you passed NSIG followed by NEXP, the definitions would be scrambled by the FP class module. Of course, the multiplication module will pass the NEXP and NSIG values the same way. In the next video, I'll parameterize the HPMOL module like we did for HP class, fix the testability issue which required commenting out the else clause as was covered in the previous video, and maybe even improve the performance a bit in the process. Again, I would ask that you share the video with others. Questions and comments are welcome in the comment section. If you found this video useful, please click like below. While you're at it, subscribe to the channel and then click the bell to be notified when new videos are available. Thanks!